Welcome to the Wealth Stream Podcast. The team at Hightower Great Lakes share their insights and passions for empowering their clients to live their best life. In this energetic podcast, we will take you on a journey to help you navigate your financial future, overcome life's challenges to reach your financial goals, and find the financial clarity you've been searching for. Let's explore the downstream impact of your wealth and what it means to you, your family, and your community to live greater. Hello and welcome to the Wealth Stream with Tim Scannell from Hightower Great Lakes. Good morning, Tim. How are you? I'm doing great, Eric. How about yourself? Oh, I'm ready for a fight. Oh, please no. <laughs> don't, don't get don't get too far down the road before you have a fight. No. Okay. All right. Well, I, I know that our topic today is conflict, and uh, wow, that's uh, that's a very wide open topic. What what specifically are we talking conflict with your city? municipality or are we talking conflict in politics what are we talking about well you know as you know we in addition to investment planning we like to focus on or help our clients with a lot of advanced planning topics you know wealth oh, yeah. transfer charitable planning uh, wealth enhancement and of course all those topics require cooperation amongst mm -hmm. the family business peers you know co-workers etc and in today's environment of we're all still going through COVID when we're recording this, I think what I'm finding, Eric, and I don't know if you've seen it, but with the lockdown, um, people are seeing a lot of each other, right? You know, they're really getting to know their idiosyncrasies, and we're seeing a little yep. more conflict than I used to in the past. Yeah, for good and bad, we're seeing people more often. I exactly. And I, I had a meeting yesterday with a uh, general contractor and. It's a family business. There's, you know, a father, the founder running it, and um, two sons who are in it. And, you know, with a lot of their employees working remote, um, they've really had the last 90 days or so in the office together. And um, they're like, okay, we need to get some of separation time or things like that. So I just think part of the reason why I wanted to talk about it today was just the environment we're in. Um, but just in general, over the, you know, 30 plus years I've done this, like I'm sure with you and your coworkers, your you know your family, everyone has different opinions about money. Everyone's at a different time point in their life as far as accumulating or getting close to um, you know exiting or retiring. Mm -hmm. So it's just a constant thing that is there. Uh, I think it's more prevalent now. And I just thought I'd talk about some of the things that we see and some of the processes that we can um, help clients with address it before it gets too far along the path. No, that that would be great. I think this is going to be extremely valuable. I don't know anybody that doesn't have any conflict of any kind. And and when you're talking finances and then also having conflict, boy, that can get really heated. Exactly. And, you know, we've done, we did a podcast uh, where there was a two-part podcast on value drivers and focusing on what variables or what key things can you focus on that drive to, to create a greater value for your business, especially mm -hmm. when you're looking to exit and part of that is, you know, next gen succession planning. Um, that really helps the value. Operations helps the value. And a lot of conflict can be created, especially when it's family next gen planning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So, where do we start with today's podcast? What I thought we'd break it out first of all and just talk about the four levels that we see of family business conflict. And, you know, maybe the listener, um, you can just watch out for it. And then we'll get into some of the ways where maybe we can mitigate it or, or at least, you know, when you see it, address it. So mm -hmm. the first one's going to be just your general everyday minor disagreements. Um, I think people have, especially with not just the COVID environment, but just there's, it's an election year, a uh, mm -hmm. lot going on in the country. There's just a lot of opinions, right? A lot of politics, uh, a lot of mask wearing, you know, we mm -hmm. had, I've had clients who insist on masks, insist on no masks, um, are agnostic about masks. The point is that these are minor disagreements, but they can fester, you know, if you're not really kind of creating a, uh, a process to, to address them up front. I mean, I, I know, Eric, you probably don't have uh, too many people in your office, but you do have a lot of remote coworkers, and mm -hmm. maybe you don't see that as much, but I, I see it happening more and more these days. Yeah, and one of the things that we run into, especially working remotely, is we're not there in person to talk, so you can't read body language. You don't know exactly what's being said when. Um, one thing that we run into as a virtual company is is we do a lot of typing to each other, and mm -hmm. 
Matt has always said something. Matt Halloran has always said something. Message sent isn't always message received. And I've heard that quote many times. That's absolutely correct. We don't know what the emotion or uh, any of the intent behind the message is. Uh, and we, maybe we woke up on the bad side of the, on the wrong side of the bed. Uh, maybe we had a really bad night the night before and we got into an argument with our, our, some of our family. I come into the office and, and I'm already in kind of a, a bad mood and I read into things that aren't actually there. And so, boy, that can really cause a rift. Yeah, especially now with so many Zoom meetings and texting and mm-hmm. emails. And I had never done Zoom prior to March 1st, and I've done 180 plus Zoom meetings now. And, you know, context isn't always um, as apparent when you're in front yeah. of somebody or talking to somebody. You can't see the the nonverbal. You just don't get it as much. So um, it, it, it can create uh, situations. And so that gets to the second one. You know, when you get beyond the minor disagreements, it becomes where uh, they become major disagreements, right? And it's feelings and emotions, and um, usually it's some sort of personal attack. Um, you know, everyone's had this before. And then beyond that, you get to the third level, which is very serious conflicts. And that's where, you know, we have a business owners, we're working with families, and they just stop talking or they stop communicating, or um, there's a lot of uh, nonverbal or, or uh, verbal communication that just isn't productive. And, you know, that's where we really have to try and bring out outside help to get that. You know, I, I have a, a client that I worked with, I learned uh, back in the 80s. And this is probably my first major lesson of this where it was a restaurant owner, several restaurants, actually multi, a lot of restaurants and seven kids, you know, four in the business, three not, the, the boys were in the business, the, the girls were not. There's just a lot of things underneath. Under, uh, like the, you look at the iceberg, you see the tip, but you don't see the underneath. Mm-hmm. And it was a situation which is common. It was very, the, the parents were just drive down, you know, here's what we're doing. And there wasn't a lot of collaboration. So it got to a point where there were serious conflicts. And um, I had to recommend that we bring in some people, uh, outsiders to help, you know, resolve those. It, it, there wasn't going to be a succession or an estate plan documented if there wasn't some sort of help. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, so in that scenario, was that more conflict with those that weren't working in the business or working within the business or a little bit of everything? Um, both. You know, when when you do estate planning and business succession planning and when you work with children, kids, beneficiaries who are in the business who are out, you, you always have the um, appearances are more important oftentimes than reality, right? So if you're mm-hmm. in the business there's just a natural thought process that, you know, I'm the one in here, I'm working, I'm generating the revenue, I'm generating the profits, um, and I'm not, you know, and, and I am have to pay dividends to the people who are not. And then the people who are not in the business just inherently have uh, the impression sometimes that, well, you know, I own part of this and I didn't get the chance and, you know, I don't know what's going on and you're getting extra benefits. And without communication, without transparency, uh, those uh, impressions just can spin out of control, and that was kind of the case in this example. It wasn't it wasn't true. I mean, the the business was hard. It wasn't as easy as the outsiders thought, and it, so we, we just needed to bring in some people to really some outside consultants, uh, mediators, to really help everyone understand better each other's perspective. Gotcha. And then you have to get it before it gets to the fourth level, which is warfare and. You know, I, I've never experienced that, but, you know, I wa- you just got to watch TV like The Sopranos or, you know, Empire. I mean, those are probably mm-hmm. way over dramatic events of it, but it, you read about them. The reality is when it gets to that level, uh, we usually have no success in uh, helping and, you know, implementing some of the things. And, and at that point, oftentimes we're relying on outsiders to really fix it or help fix it or... Um, it's just a, a, a it's just bad bad results you know down the road. Yeah. So we, we hope it never gets to that point. Yeah, uh, that's yeah that would be terrible, I, especially within any family. That's that's the biggest thing that would bother me. Exactly. And so when we're trying to address conflict with clients, um, I don't think it's um, you're going to be surprised to say to hear that you know most of the founders, most of the uh, business entrepreneurs who create these businesses are type A. Um, they're hard to delegate. They're autocratic. And um, generally, 
there's not they don't start the business with a lot of processes in place to you know to, to make sure there's proper communication make sure that um, there's formal governance and things like that so one of the things we do as a first step is we try to help them create formal governance structures now I as I've said in the past I'm not smart enough to do all this myself so the first step is really collaborating and bringing in their CPA their attorney their their banker, their trust author, if they have one, and, and really sitting down with the founder or the owners and identifying um, what are the roles, you know, what are the goals of, of each of the family members or the key employees, and then working with the formal, what we call a governance structure. So I'll give you an example. For the first, I guess, through 29, 30 years of my practice, um, I was a sole proprietor. I was the only, I was the owner. And just about a year and a half ago, I, I came to the conclusion that really just based on where the, the business is, the industry is, where technology is going, to remain small so I can continue to really service my core group of clients, I needed to be part of a bigger organization. So I ended up merging mm -hmm. with two people that I had been collaborating with, two other advisors, for the past 10 years. And since neither, none of us, the three of us, had never had partners uh, we were obviously a little concerned that, you know, how do we do this? And so we actually hired an outside consulting firm. This company is DeVoe and & Company, and they're very specific to our industry, so they understand what we do. And they really worked with us for about uh, like almost three months coming up with kind of a decision make matrix. You know, as you can imagine, there are some decisions that, you know, we don't want to create this bureaucracy where if someone wants to buy printer paper and you know they have to go through uh, three of us to get approval mm -hmm. but if we're trying to move into a new product line right if or if we're trying to if somebody wants to hire um, a key person it, it that is a decision that the three of us have to agree on so we really went through the hard work to work together the three of us to come up with a structure so that the last year and a half, as we've gone through and, and had decisions, it really there has not been conflict because we we knew what we had to do to follow those rules. So that's just one example. Yeah, I, I think that what I think everybody would agree that if you have structure in place, that can only help, right? I mean that that's mm -hmm. there's clear expectations, written rules, or whatever that is. Every you can't argue with with a process. Right? If everybody's on board with the process, then you can't argue what the process is. You, you still may not like certain decisions that are being made, but at least it's gone through the process that everyone agreed on. Yeah, and the other thing I find often with family business is something I call role drift. Uh, mm -hmm. There's the founder, the, the patriarch, you know, the, the, the kids come in the business or the key people come in the business and the roles are kind of all over the place and they kind of drift from there to there. And one of the things that the next gen are typically asking me or asking me to help them with is to really help define their role so that they can see a career path, they can see a path to ownership. Because oftentimes, especially with the relationship and the emotions between family members, those things just aren't discussed. So if you do go out and you get formal governance processes that's part of it is you know creating a flow chart you know what's the job descriptions and a lot of these companies they don't have formal job descriptions they do for their other employees but not often for their family members so it, it really goes a long way towards helping make the next gen the successors happy because they can understand and see the benefit of the hard work that they're putting into it yeah absolutely and then beyond the, the formal governance structures, the next step is, you know, again, we've talked a lot about process. And, it, you know, one of the things in the, the Value Drivers podcast we talked about was the more processes you have in place, the greater the value of the company, the greater the multiple or the value you'll get when you do exit. And one of the processes is really to create a communications, uh, or I should say, a, a way for everyone to be communicating in a consistent basis because, as you can imagine, and I'm sure you've seen this with other companies you've worked with, if if you let things fester and, and not address head on, they create problems. You know, so what I've always felt and what I've always done is if I sense that there's an issue, for example, where a client's not happy or something went wrong, you know, we we didn't process something quickly or timely enough, or there's they're not happy. I've I've always been very much um, 
a fan or my, I just, I call them. I, I, I want to get out in front of it immediately and address the issue. And yeah, we made a mistake or we need to make a change or we need to make a correction. But what I find is because of the emotional relationship typically between family members, um, if there's issues, oftentimes that, that doesn't get addressed like right up front. But if you create formal meetings, you know, where you're going to have a, an offsite meeting once a year, you're going to have a quarterly formal meeting that goes over budgets, goes over specific things. I think what you find is that, um, you know, the, the things can't get swept under the rug and uh, the communication is much better because communication and transparency it, it are really the two solutions to avoiding conflict and mm. processes are how you kind of create that for these, these uh, businesses. Yeah. And, and on the flip side of that coin, the other thing that I've seen uh, in many businesses is, is that when they are setting those types of meetings and they're doing it, like you said, annually, and then also quarterly or even monthly, um, it's, it's much easier to take subjects that need to be addressed and put it into those meetings instead of it being something that people feel like, oh, we have to talk about this right now because I don't know when we're going to be able to talk about it. And so it's something that needs to be addressed when it really doesn't need to be addressed at that moment. It's something that, okay, we, we can put on the agenda and we'll talk about it and deal with it at our, at our monthly meeting. It, it really can free up time. Exactly. And it makes everyone happier <laughs> and work more efficiently and it makes mm -hmm. the business, you know, grow faster. You know, one of the books that I often recommend clients um, read or uh, is this book called Traction by Gina Wickman. And yep. it's a pretty popular business book. Um, and there's also formal, um, like consult, there's people out there who do formal consulting engagements based on the book. But without even, you know, getting to that, the, the key thing, one of my key takeaways from that book is what he calls the people component. And this is what I, I really find is helpful for uh, family businesses in particular. And he talks about, for example, right person, wrong seat. So mm -hmm. I see this a lot where maybe you look at your son or daughter and you look at the skill sets you think they might have and you might assign them to a particular role, but it's maybe not the role that they want, right? So maybe you push them into finance or do the accounting or hand the CFO work or operations, but yet um, what they want to be more on the forecasting side, they want to be more on, you know, how are we going to grow? Or they want to meet with their customers and sales. You know, that contractor that I talked about a few minutes ago, one of the things they they discovered or they, they really identified during this COVID um, time was that one of the brothers is the key salesperson and he needs to be out selling. You know, he needs to be talking to people and, and the whole, he, he has to have that. And the fact that he hasn't been able to, um, it's been a source of frustration for him, and it kind of creates a little frustration among the, whole, the the family. And so they've they've just worked to figure out how they can get him out the door, right, and just go out and talk to somebody or do something. Yeah. But that's just his nature. And you put him behind a desk and look at numbers, and it's just it, he's in the wrong seat. You know, he's the right mm -hmm. person, he's brilliant, but he's in the wrong chair. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the things we do is, you know, as part of the process, part of the communication is really – also, just helping the, the clients, and, and again, we bring in consultants because I'm not. This isn't an area where I have an expertise, but we have a couple different consultants we bring in that can really help make sure that all the key people, the next generation, and not only beyond that, but just the key management team are the right people in the right, you know, the right seats, and um, based on core values, making sure that they all are aligned in the core values of the company, and that if there are some skill sets that they need you know, what are some of the, the training and things that they can get. Mm -hmm. So those are the, you know, I, I think if there's two things you can think about that can help avoid or mitigate conflict, it's really, it's identifying and creating and working with consultants to, fo to create these formal governance structures. And that could be your attorney, your CPA, or bring in someone from the outside. And then also creating meetings, other processes where you're kind of forcing or making sure that everyone is connecting and communicating and that everyone's in the right roles and then in the right place where they should be. Yeah, absolutely. And then if unfortunately, you know, you haven't been able to get that done and you find yourself um, not necessarily at warfare, but in some, there's serious conflict, you just have to address it head on and, and maybe bring in some business mediators or a business mediator that can really help with the process. And, 
you know, we, we had a, I did a podcast earlier, Eric, you, I, mean, I know you were called Susan Galatly. I think it was podcast mm-hmm. number 40. And she talked about a process she went through where she really helped over almost two years, her, uh, her family kind of work through a very emotional situation with a piece of land. And she does a lot of that with other companies also, but it's just one example. Of, if, you want, if you want to go back and listen to that podcast, it's a really good example of how um, a, a professional mediator might work. But the, the key is, I think, when you're looking at mediators, and one of the, one of the things we look at, we kind of kind of have a checklist that we provide for our clients, and we could also provide that to the listener, is sometimes it's just a matter of bringing in your attorney, your CPA. They understand the business. They understand you. They've been there for a while. If everybody agrees that they're the person, oftentimes when it's next gen versus the older generation, you know, they, they might want to bring in somebody who's more independent. If you decide to do that and you bring in somebody who's more independent, I, I really stress you need to make sure they have industry knowledge because every industry mm-hmm. is so different. If you're in plastics or manufacturing, if you're in, you know, commercial real estate, there's going to be mediators who have done that in your industry and they're going to do a much better job and it's going to be a much better result. But the key is that everyone has to have buy-in and, and you and everyone has to agree. So, you know, the, the patriarch, the, you can't just dictate who's going to do it. There has to be buy-in in order to make it work. But but something like that can really avoid war, warfare um, and make sure that everything gets resolved and everyone, the exit ends up being at a much higher price. So how do you think you create that buy-in? I think that the you create the buy-in by making sure that everyone who has an interest, everyone who is in the conflict is in the room or being represented in the room in mm-hmm. some way. Um, to, so you don't just go get the mediator and start addressing the issue. The first step is getting everyone in the room to agree on the fact that you need mediation. And then secondly, how, how we're going to select the mediator. And then they all have to be part of the mediation, you know, the selection process, because if a mediator comes in the door and I've never met that person or I had no input on selection of that person, I'm not going to be as open. Um, I'm not going to be, you know, I, it's not part of my decision. I'm not going to be open to participating as much maybe as if I was part of the process. So that that's a critical part of it. That's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. I think it boils down to everybody wants their voice heard, right? I, I, I don't need to say something loudly, but I sure would like it if just somebody would listen. And I think that's exactly mm-hmm. what you're talking about when when finding that common ground, just everyone knowing that I'm going to be able to represent my viewpoints and, and they're going to take time to listen to what I have to say goes so far because I think a lot of the things get closed off because people's mentality is, well, they're not going to listen to me. They don't want to hear from me. I think we've all worked for, a lot of us have worked for, for companies and businesses in the past um, where our input was not well received or even wanted, um, even if it could do well for the company, because we weren't in the upper management or we weren't up in the, you know, we weren't in that group that makes those decisions. Um, and not being listened to is, is really hard to take a lot of times. Yeah. And so I find too, in those meetings, uh, some of the best success is just asking everyone, you know, how or what questions, you know, how, how, how would you, how would you do that? What, you know, what are you seeing or what would you want versus why? It, it's it's a small thing, but it's much more, uh, it's a little more confrontational. You know, it's like, why would you want that? Or instead of mm. how would you like it done or what would you like to see? I And then I'll go back to what you just said, Eric. It's so critical. Everyone wants to be heard. Yeah. And it has to be, you have to really want to hear them and you have to really want to listen. That You know, that's critical. But you're right. If If, if everyone in the room is part of the process if everyone in the room feels like their their voice is being heard authentically i think you'll have some great success yeah absolutely all right what else are we covering today well that's really the big thing and again it, it just popped into my brain last week as i was just thinking about some meetings i've had because in, in indiana we have actually gotten back to the the office is open so we're offering zoom meetings we're offering phone meetings or in person so i have had a number of COVID safe in-person office meetings. And what I'm finding is this whole process has created some conflict, right? So 
I just wanted to talk about the types of conflict you need to be aware of and how to address it, prevent it, mitigate it. And if it's, you know, if it's there and you haven't mitigated it, how to solve it with mediation. Um, so I hope this has been helpful to everyone listening. Yeah, I, I think it definitely has been. And for those that are listening, if you are thinking, well, minor disagreements, yeah, we've got those. Oh, I'm experiencing some major disagreements or even serious conflicts. Or maybe you are in the middle of warfare. <laughs> Tim is still a great <laughs> resource not, to yes. call a listening ear. He will definitely listen to you, uh, which is the first step, right, is is opening ears and listening. And, uh, and I, I love the fact that you're so humble about it, Tim. If I don't have the skill set, I'm bringing in an expert. And I know that you have a very, very deep bench and you've got a lot of connections. So I would encourage anybody who's experiencing something like this, the first step is make that phone call. Call Tim and his team and just say, hey, here's what I'm facing. What do you think? Tim, to let them do that, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so my direct line is 219-246-5370. You could reach me via email at tscannell at hightoweradvisors.com. And our website is hightowergreatlakes.com. And yeah, we, we try to provide what we call a virtual office services. And part of that is establishing a network where we interview, screen, and you know make sure we have qualified professionals who can help. And so we have done that work, that legwork, and we have some good ideas for people who might help you with mediation or some of the other consulting. Yeah, absolutely. Again, Tim, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. This is always fun. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for tuning in and listening to the Wall Street Podcast with Tim Scannell. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Tim comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you for listening today. For everyone at Hightower Great Lakes, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the WealthStream podcast. We hope you gained some valuable insight that you can apply to your life and share with others. Please don't forget to subscribe below to be notified when new episodes become available. And don't forget to live greater. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Hightower Great Lakes. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Hightower Great Lakes is a group of investment professionals registered with Hightower Securities LLC, member FINRA and SIPC, and with Hightower Advisors LLC, a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Securities are offered through Hightower Securities LLC. Advisory services are offered through Hightower Advisors LLC.